Well, today, it's all about the love, baby. It's all about the love. Hopefully you got a handout and you'll follow along. But first we're going to read what the psalmist has. Uh, this is King David, and he's crying out and professing his love to God in Psalm 18 from the New Living Translation. He says, I love you, Lord. You are my strength. I called on the Lord who is worthy of praise and he saved me from my enemies. He rescued me from powerful enemies, from those who hated me and were too strong for me. He led me to a place of safety. He rescued me because he delights in me. For I have kept the ways of the Lord. I have not turned from my God to follow evil. I am blameless before God. I have kept myself from sin. Okay, well, if you take out your handouts. So, in 1978, the Australian pop singer, a guy by the name of John Paul Young, wrote the song, Love is in the air, everywhere I look around, love is in the air, every sight and every sound. Is that true? Do we look around and that's all we see and that's all we hear is love? I don't know about you, but that's not what I'm seeing and that's not what I'm hearing when I turn on the news these days. You know, there was an original, an old love command. It came out early in the Bible. It's in the book of Leviticus, chapter 19, verse 18. God is speaking to Moses. And he told him and all the Israelites, and he tells us today, do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against a fellow Israelite, Israelite, but love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. So we see this, that the, the love command, as it were, was already in the Torah. And Jesus, a good Jewish student, he knew that. In fact, he did because he recited it to the Pharisees when they questioned him. What's the greatest commandment? What's the most important commandment, you who think you have all the answers? That exchange is recorded in the Gospel of Matthew in chapter 22. And it says, teacher, the Pharisees asked him, Teacher, which is the most important commandment in the law of Moses? Jesus replied, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. A second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. But then there's this text where Jesus talks about even a newer love commandment. He says, so now I'm giving you a new commandment, love each other. Well, what's new about that? Well, here's the secret. That's the only half of the verse. Take a look at it from John. It says, he goes on to say, Love each other just as I, Jesus, have loved you. You should love each other. What makes this the newer love commandment? The 11th commandment, if you will. It's those six little words from Jesus Christ himself, our Savior. Love just as I, Jesus, have loved each 
and every one of you. Because now we're, we're not commanded just to love our neighbors as ourselves. That's a hard, that's a hard enough commandment. But now he raises the bar. Love as Jesus loves us. And that takes this whole idea of love to a whole new level. Now, the Greek word here that's used for new, he says, so now I'm giving you a new commandment. The Greek word there implies freshness. In other words, it means the opposite of outworn or old. It's not new as in recent, but rather a commandment to love, which is new, presented in a new and a fresh and a different way. He's trying to give us a new perspective on this notion of love. The Greek word for love is agape. We have a ministry in Wapaka that we have supported uh, that is called agape. And that simply means, in the Greek, it means an unconditional, self-sacrificing, active, volitional, thoughtful kind of love. If you, re- if you remember nothing else about agape, remember it involves sacrifice. Sacrifice. Christian author C.S. Lewis wrote a book entitled The Four Loves. And here's how he described agape to what he believed was the highest level of love known to humankind. Uh, here's what he said. Christian love is no mere sickly maiden full of sentimental emotions and honeyed words. She is a strenuous virgin, girt for service, a heroine ready for dangers and prepared to be a martyr if it be needful. Love's language is sacrifice. True Christian love involves self-sacrifice. Sacrificing our needs, our wants, our desires, and laying them down for another. The Word of God says that His love, this agape kind of love, this crazy, sacrificial, unfathomable, unconditional, immeasurable, unshakable, reckless, outrageous kind of love, The Bible says it lives in us, this agape kind of love, lives in us through the Spirit of Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit. Sadly, I think we too often forget that, the fact that this incredible love lives actually in us. You know, if you were here a couple of weeks ago for Bruce Van Atta, he made a point of talking about how he was raised and how he was raised on, at best, conditional love. And he made a point of saying, you can't give what you don't have. You can't give what you don't have. You cannot pour out of an empty vessel. So if you don't have love, you can't give love. But here's the thing. If you call yourself a Christian, you call yourself a Christ follower, then the love of God lives in you. Crazy, reckless, outrageous, sacrificial love. God's love is so powerful, someone likened it to this. It's like the Amazon River flowing down to water just one daisy. The power and the force of the Amazon River flowing down just to water one daisy. You're the daisy. You're the daisy. You're the daisy. It's like Jesus telling the story of the shepherd leaving the 99 to go after the one. This powerful force of love coming into us because of Christ and his sacrifice. Anglican Bishop J.C. Ryle says we must never forget this kind of love lives within us because to do that is to forget the gospel itself. Here's what he said. The love of Christ to sinners is the very essence and marrow of the gospel. That he should love us at all and care for our souls. That he should love us before we love him 
or even know anything about him. That he should love us so much as to come into the world to save us, to take our nature on him, bear our sins, die for us on the cross. All this is wonderful indeed. It is a kind of love to which there is nothing like it among men. He goes on to say the narrow selfishness of human nature cannot fully comprehend it. But the love of Christ to saints is no less wonderful. That he should bear with all our countless infirmities from grace to glory. That he should never be tired of our endless, countless infirmities. That he should never be tired of our endless inconsistencies and petty provocations. That he should go on forgiving and forgetting incessantly and never be provoked to cast us off and give us up. All this is marvelous indeed. No mother, no mother watching over the waywardness of her feeble babe in the days of its infancy has her patience so thoroughly tried as the patience of Christ is tried by Christians. Don't miss that part. The patience of Christ is tried by us Christians. But then he says, yet his patience is infinite. His compassions are a well that is never exhausted. His love is a love that passes knowledge. Yes, Christ's patience is tried by our very existence, our petty provocations, and our inconsistencies, and our hypocrisy. Oh, the hypocrisy. Someone said to me uh, this morning, and talking about how we have very few young people in our midst, although we do have several, and I'm really thankful for these beautiful young ladies that are here today. But he was making a point that, you know, church generally is uh, dying out. The young, the young people are not coming. Why aren't they coming? Well, the number one reason that they're not coming, they say, is that because we're all hypocrites. Hypocrisy. Number two reason they say we're judgy. Guilty, guilty, guilty again. If we could simply somehow show the love of Christ to people with whom we violently disagree, what would that look like? Might young people actually be drawn to that? Might, actual, might people actually come into the doors? And if we simply said, you are welcome here. Come as you are. Come with your questions. Come with your criticisms. Come with your anger. Come as you are. I don't, you know, again, I've said it before. I'll say it again, I don't care what you wear to church. Just cover up all your bits and pieces. Just come. Invite people to church. Bring the young people to church. We had uh, we had some littles last week, and uh, one of the littles was kind of getting fussy. And I'm like, you know, and the, the natural, the carnal part of you wants to turn around and go, but you fight against that. And internally I say, oh, thank you, Jesus, for this young family that's bringing this babe to the house of the Lord. Because when you have them baptized, that's the promise you make. You're going to bring them to the house of the Lord and teach them. The late great Christian singer and songwriter Rich Mullins said this, I think that of all the diseases in the world, the disease that all humankind suffers from, the disease that is most devastating to us, is not AIDS, it's not gluttony, it's not cancer, it's not any of those things. 
It is the disease that comes about because we live in ignorance of the wealth of love that God has for us. There's a little girl uh, by the name of Jessica. She was eight years old, and here's how she put it. She said, you really shouldn't say, I love you, unless you mean it. But if you mean it, you should say it a lot. People forget. <laughs> yeah, we forget. We tend to say that to our loved ones. I love you, I love you. You know, when I talk to my boys, um, who are adult people now, we never, ever, ever end a telephone conversation or a visit without the end, I love you. But that should be true for all of us. We should say that. So turn to your neighbor, turn to someone around you, say, I love you. Do it, Lloyd. <laughs> Sixty-five years, you can still say I love you to your bride. I can't turn it. Floyd says I can't turn as easily as that. You know, too often we do, we forget. We forget how much God loves us. And we forget that that same love lives in us through the Spirit of Jesus. And because we forget, we struggle with this newer love commandment. Just as Jesus loves us, we're to love one another. So how do we become obedient to this 11th commandment? That's what I'm calling it. Added on an 11th commandment. Let me give you two words, and they're in your handout. Two words. The first word is pattern. Pattern. First, we need to remember that the sacrificial love that Jesus exemplified for us in his ever so brief uh, lifetime, we must learn to follow the pattern of Jesus' love. We must follow the pattern of Jesus' love. We must need, we need to make room for in our hearts for the marginalized. As when Jesus called the little children into his arms, when children were thought to be nothing back in Jesus' day. We need to remember a love that cares for the despised of society, as when Jesus healed the daughter of a despised Canaanite woman. We need to foster a love that thinks of others while one is in the midst of unbearable suffering. As when Jesus, who is hanging, bleeding on the cross, nailed to a cross, naked and just without breath, calls out to John the Apostle to take care of his beloved mother Mary in his last few words. We need to foster a love that cares for the poor and the vulnerable. As when Jesus had having compassion on the widow from Nain, raised her only son from the dead. We need to foster a love within us that speaks to and spends time with those who are shunned by society as when Jesus took time out to give words of eternal life to the Samaritan woman at the well. A love that forgives and refuses to condemn those who are clearly in the wrong. As when Jesus refused to accuse the woman in adultery. He who is without sin, go ahead and cast the first stone. And what happened? They all walked away. Sinners in need of a savior. Just like you, just like me. A love that gladly suffers interruption. As when Jesus, when a paralyzed man suddenly appeared before Jesus, when his friends lowered him through a hole in the roof. We need to foster a love that survives the doubt of a good friend. Like Thomas, who doubted the glorious claims of Jesus, that he would defeat sin, death, and the devil and rise again from the dead. 
We need to foster a love that humbles itself to serve those who have betrayed us. As Jesus did when he dined with Judas at the Last Supper. We need to foster a love that forgives even the greatest of rejections. As when Jesus washed the feet of Peter, knowing Peter would deny him not once, not twice, but three different times. It's one thing to love our neighbors as ourselves. It's an entirely different thing to love others as Jesus Christ has loved us. It means to love those who have been cruel and unkind and uncaring to us. To those who have gossiped about us and slandered us and who have broken our hearts. It means to love the unlovable and those who have indeed betrayed and rejected us. Take a look at the uh, text from Matthew. I think we have it here. From Matthew 25, from the contemporary English version. Jesus is saying this, When I was hungry, you gave me something to eat. And when I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. When I was a stranger, you welcomed me. And when I was naked, you gave me clothes to wear. When I was sick, you took care of me. And when I was in jail, you visited me. Then the ones who please the Lord will ask, When did you, when did we give you something to eat or drink? When did we welcome you as a stranger, give you clothes to wear, or visit you while you were sick or in jail? The king will answer, Whenever you did it for any of my people, no matter how unimportant they seemed, you did it for me. You did it for me. So, now remember we said there are two parts to this incredible new standard of love. There's the pattern, and then there's the power of Jesus' love. The power source of Jesus' love. The power source. What's the power source? The power source is the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity. The one who lives and dwells within each and every Christian. Within every person who pledges love and loyalty and trusting faith in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. To love others as Jesus loves us, we have to yield to, surrender to, humble ourselves to, and then draw upon the power source of the Holy Spirit within us. Because we cannot do it on our own. We can love those who love us. We can love those who are obedient. We can love those who think like us, because they're so smart, right? We can love those who vote like us, and we can love those who... who See the world view like us? Well, that's the easy part. But to love like Jesus loves? Well, that's to love the people with whom you violently disagree. Those people who have chosen a lifestyle, in your opinion, that is sinful and unholy. Did anywhere in there, did he say, but be sure you don't love those sinners? No. Because we're all sinners. We're all sinners in need of a Savior. And we're all called to, to call upon the Holy Spirit within us. Take a look at this verse from Acts. It says, before Jesus went to, to be with his Father, he says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Now, this original Greek word for power is dunamis. Dunamis. It means a force. It means a miraculous power. It means explosive power. It's where we get the word dynamite and dunamis. It's explosive. When you work and live and act in the power of the Spirit, you have explosive love for everyone. And it does not discriminate. In Romans... 
Paul writes, the Spirit of God, that's another name for the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. So this same explosive power of God, this power to love sacrificially, it lives in us. It's the power of the Spirit. From Romans 5.5, 5, God's word says, For we know how dearly God loves us because he's given us his Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with love. Corey Ten Boom, who was a Holocaust survivor and a wonderful, wonderful Christian author, she said this, Trying to do the Lord's work in your own strength is the most confusing, exhausting, and tedious of all. Excuse me, of all work. But when you are filled with the Holy Spirit, then the ministry of Jesus flows out of you. So, to paraphrase that, trying to love others as Jesus loves, trying to do that in our own strength, we will fail. We will ultimately fail. We will be exhausted. And we will give up. But when we're filled with the Holy Spirit, the love of Jesus will just flow out of us. Ephesians, Paul writes, don't be drunk with wine because that will ruin your life. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit. You know, when someone's drunk, they're under the influence of alcohol. What happens when that happens? Well, there's another power that's controlling them. They're being controlled by this spirit of alcohol. What happens when they're under the influence? Well, they tend to think differently. They, they act differently. Sometimes they speak differently. Scripture says, don't be under the influence of another spirit. Be under the influence of the Holy Spirit. What will happen when you're under the influence of the Holy Spirit? This power of the Spirit will overtake you. And be you will and I will be able to love just as Jesus loves us. We'll be able to keep the 11th commandment. Why? Because we're not operating out of our own strength or our own our own humanity. We're, un, we're operating under the supernatural power and love of Christ. We're called to love others without regard to denominations or religious labels or labels of any kind or status in society. There are no conditions to God's great love. I'm going to close uh, this uh, message with a little story to tell you about the power of words and the power of love. And uh, it's a story that was uh, comes from a Sunday school ministry that was part of New York City, a part of New York City that had been rated the most likely place to get killed. The pastor there, Pastor Bill Wilson, had been stabbed twice, he had been shot at, and a member of his team had been killed. And he tells this story. One Puerto Rican lady, after being, getting saved in church, came to me with an urgent request. She didn't speak a word of English, so she told me through an interpreter, I want to do something for God, please. I don't know what you can do, I answered. Please let me do something, she said in Spanish. Okay, I'll put you on a bus. Ride a different bus every week and just love the kids. So every week she rode a different bus. You see, we have 50 of them. And she loved the children. She would find the worst looking kid on the bus, put him on her lap, and whisper over and over the only words she had learned in English. I love you. Jesus loves you. After several months, she became attached to one little boy in particular. I don't want to change buses anymore. I want to stay on this one bus, she said. The boy didn't speak. He came to Sunday school every week with his sister and sat on the woman's lap, but he never made a sound. Each week, 
she would tell him all the way to Sunday school and all the way home, I love you and Jesus loves you. One day, to her amazement, the little boy turned around and stammered, I love you too. Then he put his arms around her and gave her a big hug. That was 2.30 on a Saturday afternoon. At 6.30 that night, the boy was found dead in a garbage bag under a fire escape. His mother had beaten him to death and thrown his body in the trash. I love you and Jesus loves you. Those were some of the last words he heard in his short life from the lips of a Puerto Rican woman who could barely speak English. Who among us is qualified to minister? Who among us even knows what to do? Not you, not me, but I ran to an altar once and I got some fire and just went. So did this woman who couldn't speak English. And so can you. It is the fire and the power of the Holy Spirit living in us that can say to those around us, without embarrassment, without condition, without judgment, I love you. I love you. I love you. Imagine the power of those words. When I would uh, be at a hospice, as a hospice chaplain, or uh, when I was working as a chaplain at Bethany, almost every time before I left anyone's bedside, whether they were well or whether they were perhaps actively dying, I would make it a point of telling them, you know, don't forget Jesus loves you, and so do I. It's the power and the pattern of the 11th commandment. That is our call. That is what we need to do, even with those with whom we violently disagree. So go out and remember this. It's all about the love, baby. It's all about the love. Amen. Please join in singing at the cross, love ran red.